are going to be talking about end of the year transfer pricing tips for Malaysia taxpayers. Um, I think the reason why we thought to put together this webinar is because a lot of the times there isn't a lot of confusion from an operational point of view. How does transfer pricing work in reality? And is it the same as doing just a TP documentation from compliance purposes? How does a taxpayer actually implement in reality what the TP documentation says? So hopefully with today, we should be able to give you a few tips on this. Before we start, let me just give a brief overview of our firm and ourselves in one minute. As I know, some of you are quite familiar to us. Nevertheless, for those that are new, we are a transfer pricing firm that specializes in advising uh, multinational companies in the areas of transfer pricing. Um, we have three offices, uh, Australia, Singapore, and Malaysia, from which we cater to all the Asia Pacific region, not only Australia or Singapore and Malaysia, we actually do advise companies in the whole region. Um, we are also very uh, active in the industry, um, contributing with the industry journals, and always, apart from having our monthly webinars, we have different accolades where we speak and we basically share with uh, companies and uh, with the industry tips on transfer pricing. So let me just introduce Hon Chuan Tan for some of you who might be familiar with him, but he's the, our director and technical lead for Malaysia with more than 10 years of experience advising multinational companies in the area of transfer pricing and also previously um, developing uh, transfer pricing practice for one of the uh, big, large mid-tier mid firms in Malaysia as well. Apart from Malaysia experience, Hon Chuan also has a first-hand experience uh, with uh, transfer pricing in Malaysia, Asia Pacific region, uh, Singapore, Australia. So that's basically we're very fortunate to have him now almost five years with us. Um, my name is Adriana Calderon. I'm the co-founder of Transfer Pricing Solutions Asia and Malaysia and technical lead for both our offices with more than 15 years of experience in international tax and transfer pricing prior to transfer pricing solutions. I was part of uh, big four and mid-tier consulting firms uh, advising in areas of international tax together with transfer pricing. So with that, maybe we just kick start to with the content for today and what we're going to be covering. So we will be discussing three key things. First, um, we will be giving a little uh, an overview about the key aspect of implementation, which is the transfer pricing cycle and how does the TP documentation for compliance purposes interacts with the actual implementation of the policies during the year. Second, we will be talking about the different type of TP adjustments that are available in Malaysia. And third, we will be talking about being audit re ready and what are some of our tips to consider any adjustment at year end. And with that, let me just pass it on to Hon Chan with the first topic for today. All right, thanks, Adriana. Um, yeah, time flies, is we are going into November now and we've had a, you know, a great TP journey this year and I'll, I hope our audiences to do too. So this webinar will be sort of recapping the important points for the year as well as, you know, also going forward measures, right? So it's actually crucial to keep in mind that TP is as important as you know, other areas, you know, be it tax or audit, right? So it's going to require education within the organization so that you know, key stakeholders within the group are 
aware that there will be risks involved which needs to be managed as part of a good governance within the group, right? So usually, you know, when you manage um, DP, lots of companies focuses on the compliance work, you know, your TB documentation, especially when transactions have occurred and you know, your books have closed. But however, the, the actual preparation for reviews and audits should start when the company enters or plan to enter into a related party arrangement. Hence, it's actually quite important to have that awareness in place and understanding that TP is a risk and that needs to be managed as part of tax and international tax risks, right? Um, I think the slide, yeah, there you go. I'm going to go through um, transfer pricing circle cycles now. So the best way to understand your TP arrangement is by going through you know, the stages of the TP cycles, yeah, the more reliable TP cycles, which are um, your planning and policies, and then price setting and contracts, transaction and journal entries, testing and clients, and go to monitoring your documentation. And lastly, of course, if um, question to go through the controversy and the litigations, right? So generally, majority of the taxpayers would have started at the testing and the compliance phase where your transaction has already occurred, which is mainly due to the lack of you know, awareness in TP and hope that has already improved since then. And what we have experienced so far is that there is a direct correlation between success rate of an audit and going through the TP cycles from the first stage, which is the planning phase. Right. Hence, it's very important to first go through the planning phase and plan your TP arrangement and go through the cycles accordingly. Okay, I think I'm going to go through the planning and policies phase. So first phase, as I said earlier, very crucial planning and policy, which is ideally where the process should commence. Right? A TP policy is put in place, which set out your group's TP framework. And you know, some of the questions that you can ask yourselves are, you know, what's your company stand, your group stands or approach in TP? Who is responsible for TP within that group? You know, you may have like a local person in charge or maybe a regional person in charge of a specific region, like APAC, for example. And then you know, the next question is how is the unplanned standard applied? Um, this is where you have your benchmarking analysis. Um, you know, be it benchmarking searches or other TP methods um, to come up with the arm's length pricing within the group. And then lastly, you know, whether the TP frameworks aligns with your business model and your know, overall strategy of your business, right? So you, it doesn't, your business should not work around, you know, the, the rules, TP rules of tax. TP rules of tax should complement your business strategy, right? So that's where you have to ensure that the, you know, the policies framework are consistent or complement your business strategy, so to speak. Then, yeah, here I would like to emphasize that TP planning is very crucial, right? Because if your TP framework is done properly and everything else should fall in place as long as everything is implemented accordingly. So communication is actually key key here, right, where everyone in your organization from top to bottom should understand that there is actually a TP framework and policies in place to comply with the arm's length um, principle. Uh, Hong Chun, I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot here because this sure. is a typical question that we get a lot of the times. Mm. Is the TP policy equal to a TP documentation? Yeah, a lot of the people think that, you know, oh, I have that TP policy in place, or maybe I have a group TP policy in place. Is that, is that relevant? Is that possible for me to just provide that TP policy to the RB? And then that's done deal, right? So I think that's a misconception here where, you know, TP policy is just a policy in place for you, for you, the delineation of the transactions, understand your cost base, or, or the arm's length, that adheres to the arm's length principle. But a TP documentation is actually more 
more than a fee policy have gone through all the requirements under the transfer pricing guidelines and the TP policy is part of a TP documentation, right? So the TP documentation consists of a lot of sections, you know, from your analysis, this point, FA, the business operation, and then details of the real value transactions, then testing a coming analysis to make sure that you're at arm's length. I think another aspect that, that's that's a very good point. Another uh, aspect here is that a lot of the times the TP policies, what they really cover is the implementation part. So, for example, things like okay, which we usually the TP documentation are not covered. So, uh, how frequent, how what what is the frequency of the invoices? Uh, who is responsible to raise invoices? What happens if there is instances of shortfalls? Um, so it, it addresses everything that comes from an implementation point of view. What is a step by step, depending on how complex the mm -hmm. transaction is, it might cover step by step uh, some aspects of how particularly focus on the accounting side of mm -hmm. the transaction, um, which usually in the TP documentation you are not covering because the TP documentation is kind of a exercise after it happened and it focuses more on compliance rather than the nitty gritty of the implementation. Yeah. Please. All right, so next part is um, price setting, right? After your policy, then you have price setting and Right. Once the TP framework is set out, then the contract should be formalized based on the arm's length price you know, that has been benchmarked um, in the first phase as other terms and conditions that should be put in place. Now, it will only be formalized when both parties sign the contract. And it's important to show the negotiation process between the party with evidence. Um, you, know, you have your minutes or your emails as more so now that Arabi are requesting for these types of evidence, you know, on top of your contracts, contracts are very important. I think context is a requirement, so you need to have the contract in place, but evidence as well that the contract has been formalized. And lastly, the contract is not just a document that you just um, signed and then put somewhere in the folder or your shelf and be forgotten. It should be reviewed annually to check whether there are any changes to the pricing or your business operations or any of the terms and conditions within the contract so that the document remains up to date, right? So now we're not just talking about TP documentation remaining up to date. We're also talking about the contract remaining up to date as well, you know, contemporaneous contracts, right? So that's where you have to make sure that it's up to date. I guess the, question, the, the answer to this question is rather obvious, which is, is the contract the same as the TP documentation? Yeah, so I think similarly, I think similar to the policy contracts, it's just um, documenting down all, you know, details or transactions, the pricing, Again, not, not a TB documentation, right? Similar to the policies that apply. I guess the contract is just the legal document that basically formalize the arrangements and the terms and conditions in which the parties are gonna be um, carry on the transaction. <laughs> and they, 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 they are important and they have become even more important because without the contracts, uh, you leave a lot of aspects to interpretation of the tax authority, which one can um, manage to some extent in the TP documentation. But nevertheless, we have experienced that the contracts is always the first document that we were we get asked by the tax authorities. And I would say IRB is definitely one of them. And then obviously to have some starting point or to determine what was the relationship or the terms and conditions in the transaction. Yeah. So 
contracts is where we're talking about form, right? Substance of form, that's, that's our form, right? So the next phase is implementation. So this step is equally important. And now that we have the form done, then here we have the substance that comes into picture. The implementation phase is to make sure that you have implemented, what you have implemented ties back to your contracts, right? More often than not, we see cases where the TP policies or documentation are correct, but there are a lot of discrepancies between your know, invoices against your contracts or against your policy. You know, for example, there are errors in markups or errors in distributions, for example, then that there are consistencies um, already. Now, this is very important because usually RRB will also request for your book papers. Right, so your invoicing, recordings in management uh, accounts, um, then they use your TP policy and documentation, and they do a cross check to see whether you know everything's consistent. All right, everything is implemented as the form. So the expectation is consistency between all of them. Otherwise, you know, if they are inconsistent in place, then you're essentially providing more areas for the RB to scrutinize. And then you know to ask more questions. Then, if you have more inconsistency, then it's more like more bullets for the RB to shoot back at you, right? So you have to make sure that implementation that are indeed implemented accordingly. I have to say that that's probably one of our biggest challenges where we have observed, mm -hmm. which is usually we are doing a documentation of a transaction that already happened mm -hmm. for compliance purposes doing the whole trail of making sure that okay what was the transaction how was the price agreed and how was it implemented it seems easy but it is actually one of the most difficult things to do because a lot of the times if there is there hasn't been any thinking around it it is extremely difficult and then that's where the risk in the documentations start because then it's like, okay, but if there is no consistency in all of this, how are we going to explain that the tax return has been completed properly? Mm -hmm. So in an ideal world, we want what it should happen is that there is a proper policy with proper planning, implementation, and then the documentation, which is why that's the order of, of, of what we're talking about today. Yeah. Um, which is probably what you're just gonna cover in this in this slide. Yeah, I think coming back to implementation, I think that that's where the constraint lies, where a lot of the times we are doing the analysis, but then implementation where I explained earlier, a lot of your, everyone in the organization should be aware of this pricing. It's not just, because only we deal with finance managers, you know, top of the line, but the person doing the work, you know, journals, invoices, they may not be aware and they may not be aware of policies in place. So it's good to have everyone in place to understand this concept and the DB policies to make sure that it's consistent throughout, right? So that's very crucial. And then once you've gone through this implementation, phase, then the next phase, testing and compliance, you know, this is the phase where a lot of people, are, uh, the taxpayers are familiar with, you know, the tax, Testing and compliance involves mainly the preparation of the contemporaneous documentation that tests the pricing of a transaction, right? The idea is that this testing is performed at the same time of entering into that um, real buy transaction. The reason for this is to make sure that, you know, if adjustments are required, that then they can be done before closing the books or before lodging the tax return. Some companies that follow good governance and perform benchmark, benchmark analysis, the planning, and then when they enter into the video by transaction and set up the price based on the study to make sure that adjustments are generally not required, you know, if they are properly adhered to um, and monitored consistently. Now, as part of you know, interviews that were conducted previously, it was good to know that most of the health taxes you know, understand you know, the importance of TP and doing nothing is currently no not longer an option. And compliance with TP and principle has to be implemented within the organization. If 
taxpayers still have that you know, wait and see approach, which is quite common uh, in Malaysia, unfortunately. And I think it will become more of a, I told you so, you know, on the other side, right? So if you wait and see, now that with, with the new penalties in place, you know, the, the um, 20 to 100,000, then within the shortened period of time to provide the TV documentation, I think it's not really an option now to do nothing. And one of the RRB personnel also mentioned that a lot of taxpayers, they were not able to provide contracts and documents during the request of information phase, right? And that does not provide confidence um, to the RRB that the taxpayers has good governance um, in relation to TP. And it's almost certain that if you provide insufficient documents, you're likely fighting a losing battle. So it's always good to have all these documents in place um, for being an audit. Okay, to continue on the tax and compliance. So I guess this is more of the theory part where the, the approaches are surrounding this depending on the jurisdiction, right? First would be at the time of entering the transaction, which is ex ante, and second, which is after the transaction has happened exposed, which is where a lot of people, uh, a lot of taxpayers are at, right? So as explained, ex ante means you have tested your transaction when you have entered into the transaction and know the outstanding price of it, while ex post, basically you test your transaction that has already happened, you know, finger cross and you make sure that it's actually outstanding, right? And then the next slide, just to put um, in relation to Malaysia, Right. In Malaysia, the Income Tax Act TP rules 2012 states that a contemporaneous TP documentation means the TP documentation is brought into existence when a person is developing or implementing any controlled transaction. Right, that's one. And or where in a basis period for a year of an assessment, the controlled transaction is put in review and there are material changes the documentation should be updated prior to that due date for finishing a return for that basis here. So at the time of your, uh, before lodging your income tax return. So this means that for Malaysia, the, the stand, the RV stand is that they're taking the X and A stands and require testing to be done prior or at the time of entry, right? So we need to make sure that this applies to us as well as Malaysia. And then the next phase is after you've done your um, tax compliance and everything properly, the TP documentation up and contemporaneous, then the next phase is monitoring, right? So annual reviews, I think there's also a lot of misconceptions on annual reviews that TP documentation, if there are no material changes, then it, you don't need to do perform any review annually, right? Now, I understand that you know, the biggest effort in preparing the TPA documentation is for the January the first year, where it has to be prepared from scratch. Once it is completed, it should be maintained every year, right? So even if the business doesn't change, the expectation is to update your financial information of the comparable company and the rest and financial of the rest of the document. And then you know, the fact pattern would most likely remain the same if there are no changes in the business. And then, you know, it can be as simple as you know, an addendum to the original documentation, updating financial rules, and stating that no changes have happened in the business. Now, news in the TP guidelines, it states that new searches are expected to be performed every three years. So year one, big exercise, and year two, and year three, only update financials. And year four, a new search um, should be done again. Right. So if there are no changes, then it's, the key is to just update the documentation and assess how much of the documentation needs to be changed. Now, so I've gone through this, this is where the whole cycle uh, is in place. So now I've gone through the cycles. Adrian, it'd be great, great if you could you know, share with us what are the types of you know, adjustments that are generally performed in uh, Asia. Sure. 
<clears throat> but before I go through that, I do have uh, a question. Question, small <laughs> question. Yes. Okay. Annual review, we're referring about DP documentation for compliance purposes. Hmm. Uh, what about contracts and policies? And yeah. like, if you have a situation where there is no variation from one year to the other, can your policy stay and your contract stay as well? Yeah, so basically, it, it actually all depends, right? So by right, if the business has no change, the terms and conditions between the contract has no changes um, whatsoever, the pricing stays the same. Generally, then the contract can remain the same. It, it, it still needs to be reviewed, right? The, the process of that review is to make sure that um, all the terms and conditions within the contract or policy remain the same, then there's no changes. Right. So when you've done that, then that should be sufficient. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Hong Chun. <clears throat> so let's talk about TP uh, adjustments and the type of adjustments that we have in Malaysia. And now you can also uh, ask impromptu questions or do impromptu comments if you want to as well. Um, payback time. Um, so anyway, um, so as we were talking about the, the first question is, what is a transfer pricing adjustment? So an adjustment is basically adjusting the price on the transaction to make sure that the uh, transaction achieves or reaches the arm's length price agreed either by contract or by the parties uh, somehow. So the taxpayers can adjust before, um, meaning I will say it's kind of like self-adjustment, uh, also known as true ups or true downs um, during the year. So that's adjustment number one. So the question always that we get is like, oh, uh, is it okay to do, to do through ups or through downs? Is it okay within, uh, is it compliance with the arm's length principle? Will the tax authority take it badly if you do through ups or through downs um, by a taxpayer? And the answer is yes, you can do that. that that's actually the normal way in which uh, transfer pricing adjustments that are need to be done by the taxpayer do, during the year are done. And the reason I said this is because we had situations where um, sometimes the, the taxpayer or the auditors are not comfortable with these true ups and true downs because they are not used to having to do this periodically review of the prices. So that's uh, obviously adjustment number one. Adjustment number two is basically uh, adjustments that are done by the tax authority uh, as a result of an audit. The difference is that when the taxpayer do through ups or through down or adjustments, this is done during the financial year, before you close the books, before you present your uh, tax computation. Whereas the second one, which is audit uh, uh, adjustments are more um, damaging to the taxpayer because they will always come for prior year tax returns. So essentially what the tax authority does when it does a transfer pricing adjustment because of an audit is opening a prior year tax return and telling the taxpayer, hey, I believe that your tax computation is wrong due to transfer pricing misprice. And therefore you need to amend. Now, because that means opening prior years, what is gonna have as an impact for the taxpayer is that there is a very high chance that there is not going to be able, or the taxpayer is not going to be able to do the symmetrical adjustment in the counterparty books. And that's where we end up in double taxation scenarios. We also have to keep in mind that when it comes to audits, the audits don't happen straight away after you present your tax return. They can happen several years after you present the tax return. 
which is why it's so important what Hon Chuan was saying earlier, the whole um, importance of having proper record keeping and proper policies in place, because if someone is asking about a transaction that happened three or five years ago, then it's quite uh, difficult to come back to it if you don't have proper um, uh, record keeping and evidence. So let me just uh, show you an example here. So let's assume that we have a taxpayer in Malaysia, company C, that provides uh, services to an entrepreneur and the company in Malaysia is a service provider, an ETCOS plus entity, meaning a cost center, and all it gets is revenue from the related parties of 1 million, and its profit before tax is 50,000, 50, and it reaches 5%. Or let's, let's assume that the company uh, has uh, agreed that their remuneration for the type of services that they do is 5%. So there is a couple of, of issues here um, before obviously even thinking about adjustments. So obviously, if the company is a cost center and is only earning a markup, then the assumption is that the functional profile of company C is of a cost center. So we wouldn't have development of IP. Uh, we wouldn't have uh, some of the strategic decisions in company C. So that's the assumption. Once that assumption is correct and valid, then the question is, okay, how did we agree on the price in the contract be between the entrepreneur and company C? Okay, so if the contract said that, and the policy says that it's going to be 5% markup on total cost. So there has to be some definition of what that cost is, et cetera, et cetera. But obviously, company C, in theory, should be invoicing every month for the services that it provides to entrepreneur. Or they can decide that they are going to do the invoicing every year based not on actual, but based on budgeted monthly cost. Okay, based on the prior year monthly cost. So you could do it based on budget or based on actual. When you do it based on budget, you may have issues at the year end because if the budget didn't have some variations, maybe let's say there was more cost than what we budgeted for, then obviously company C needs to monitor this uh, to make sure that at year end, my management accounts reach a 5% markup, which is what I agree with my related party. And even if it's actuals as well, because the actuals may have some variation, which is why it's so important to check at year end before closing the books that that 5% is rich. Now, typical questions that we get asked in this 5% is like, oh, what can I adjust out of the cost base? In theory, as a general principle, and again, assuming that this is an entity which is a cost center, um, the company should have uh, basically all, or the company should check these based on earnings before interest and tax. So in other words, what we can only adjust in theory is what it is considered non-operational expenses. And as a general rule of thumb, that is actually tax and interest expense. And even I believe that in Malaysia, there is some technicalities on this point of interest expense, which has to be associated with the actual loans, right, Honchan? Mm, that's correct. Yeah. So that's something to be careful of. So things that you cannot adjust are like foreign exchange risk, which is one of the most common that I see. Um, I'm trying to think of foreign examples, but the point is that obviously IRB has no interest in this scenario for 
companies need to adjust its, its cost base a lot because if you adjust the cost base a lot, you end up not earning any markup at all. So you have to be very careful. And even they have said it many times that it has to be understood case by case, depending on the expense type to do adjustments, okay? So if the company doesn't reach the 5%, let's assume that they did the 4% or they did 3% or they did 2% and the agreement says that it was 5%. That's where IRB can really um, challenge the company and pursue an audit if they are picked up for a review. Do you have any comments on this? Um, yeah, I was just thinking more on you know, what people ask regarding your know, adjustments. Let's say you want to make an adjustment. Uh -huh. um, how can you, what's the what what can you how can you make an adjustment through is it through like a credit node or is it a, a charge back through something called management fee or how it, what's the normal process? It, it depends on the type of transaction. Usually what I have seen it is dealing with it via credit nodes, depending if it's up or down, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's actually a good question. So this is exactly what we were talking about. This is adjustments that one can do up to year end, which is basically to make sure that the arm's length price is rich. Obviously, there is the option to do true ups and true downs, meaning increase or decrease the price. Obviously, there is some, or what we have experienced is that if there is adjustment to be done for Malaysian taxpayers. Um, maybe the company can plan on the basis of true ups. Maybe they are easier to explain that decreasing your price. Nevertheless, if there is a justification for it, then uh, if there is an explanation for us to be able to implement a TP policy, then you, you have to have your evidence as to why you're doing it. If it's true down, meaning decreasing the price. Uh, obviously, in any case, the TP documentation uh, needs to be there. Um, it needs to be performed uh, before closing the books. And obviously, there could be still be an audit um, before by IRB, even if you do a through up and through down, because this is just an adjustment that the taxpayer does to his own books to reach to a transfer price. And I think another aspect to always keep in mind is any issues with costumes and indirect tax because if a service or if a trade is subject to indirect tax and costumes, then the question is, well, you also have to amend that as well. In Malaysia, we also have the voluntary disclosures, which is basically where the taxpayer has the option to come I call it to come clean <laughs> before the chasing the, the chasing game. So instead of watch and see if the taxpayer has um, a concern that a particular year there was a very big exposure in transfer pricing, there is the option to do a voluntary adjustment that can be do can be done in theory for adjusting prices upwards or downwards. Um, for this, there has to be a process in place to request because this for this, you have to present your case in front of, I, of IRB with a written disclosure on a form with the estimation of the tax payable or the adjustment, where, which is your proposed adjustment. And you will have to provide other documents such as the TP documentation, contracts, and Basically, you have to build your case to present it to IRB and basically convince them as to why it, it is reasonable for them to accept the voluntary disclosure. Um, so we, I talked earlier that basically the, the TP adjustments to if, if, there is exposure and the taxpayer doesn't decide to go to the voluntary disclosures, but decides to stay on a wait and see game. 
if there is an audit and um, the audit is successful for IRB and they are able to prove that the prices are not in compliance with the TP provisions, then they can um, do an ordinary adjustment for prior year's uh, tax returns. I think what is, is, is important to keep in mind is the, the penalties because in an audit case, if you have non-compliance with TP documentation, that alone gives rise to a penalty between 20 ringgit to 100. Uh, thousand, sorry, not 20, 20,000 to 100,000. Um, and obviously, if there is plus a 50% penalty on the TP adjustment, um, if there is TP documentation and it is compliant, you will be, but still, the IRB doesn't agree with the price. The penalty is 30%. So it's, it's lower because it's reduced from 50 to 30%, plus you don't have the non-compliance penalty. And this one is good to look at it in the, in, the, in the eyes of the voluntary disclosures, because if you do it by a voluntary disclosure and IRB still does uh, pursue an adjustment, uh, it will be subject to a 20% uh, penalty. So obviously, I will say that if a company has a very, very big exposure, maybe the voluntary disclosure is not a bad avenue to pursue to fix that exposure. Okay, I think, I, I don't know if you have any, any more comments on this nope. or if you wanna continue with uh, this part. Yeah, Um. okay, I think we're gonna go go with the audit rating and annotated tips. Um, if you go through a simplified example, right? So if you go to the next slide. Okay. Um, here you can see that, you know, company A with the head office sells um, property B in Malaysia, which is a distribution company. So that, you know, it's for the Malaysian market, right? And in this simplified example, then we can sort of gauge, you know, what are the common disputes, you know, how how the, the group can be audit ready, and then whether the group itself or in relation to this transaction, whether any adjustments um is to be performed, right? So the common area of disputes that we have gone through so far, you know, we have um, first up, which is, you know, structures or transactions with lack of substance, right? So here we have issues with incorrect character characterization. So if you look at company B, are we correctly characterizing company B as a distributor company, right? That, that will be based on, you know, whether you have performed a function analysis or and there may be issues with mismatches of substance over form or issues with no contract. So when you have no contracts in place and there are no formalized contracts, then IRB could then go through the process and without any form in place, right? So it really depends on whether company B is forming as um, documented down in the contracts or the TB documentation. Then other areas of disputes can be incorrect pricing. So when you buy from company A, for example, are uh, any of the pricing or margins supported by uh, a benchmarking study or not? Right? How is the price um, derived from? Is it arm's length? If it does it adhere to arm's length principle or not? Then whether the price or margin are defined correctly in your contracts. So making sure that your contracts are reviewed and making sure that the terms and conditions at that point in time are as per the contract, right? So sometimes there are lack of monitoring during the year to achieve the length pricing as agreed in the contract, right? 
The next one may is um, recurrent loss makers. So companies with recurrent loss makers in competition with high value related by transactions would pose a high risk and exposure to the group itself. So it really depends on looking at company B as a distributor. Is company B um, consistently loss making? And why is it consistent loss making? Are there any, is it because of the transfer mispricing or is it because of other commercial reasons which should then be properly documented down in your DB documentation? Then choices of comparable companies. So in Malaysia, local comparables are very much preferred and RB is very adamant that taxpayers in Malaysia when they prepare the DB documentation should um, search for Malaysian comparable companies um, in their benchmarking search, right? So bear that in mind. And I understand that, you know, we have the, the COVID in place. Um, there will be questions on whether loss-making companies or loss-making comparable companies um, can be accepted or not, right? So that needs to be dealt with um, case by case basis, depending on the industry, right? And another one would be what point in the arm's length range is acceptable, right? So generally, we use the Intel Kotal range, which is the 25th and 75th percentile, right? So based on our experience with RRB, as well as I think it was stated in one of the question and answer FAQ with RRB that they are aiming at the median points, right? So when you perform a benchmark study, and you need to look at the median point and see whether it, your margin actually lies between the median and above, mm -hmm. right? So you may, they may, RB may adjust your margin upwards during audit if it's below the median. So if you have performed the benchmarking and the median is actually below median, then in your TP documentation, it really needs to be documented down and make sure that why is your company below the median range of your range of um, acceptable comparable companies, right? And lastly, TP adjustments. So on key TP adjustments, as Adriana has mentioned earlier, you know, it's generally allowed before closing of the books. So be cautioned with you know, indirect taxes and customs where retrospective adjustments can be challenging and it will give rise to double taxation. So we have to really bear that in mind. So these are sort of the common areas of disputes when you have um, a really prior transactions. And obviously a lot of taxpayers would have a lot more uh, complex transactions. So make sure that you have gone through this point and that your really transactions are cross-checked against these points to make sure that you are soft full proof to the next step. Okay, so I think you kind of went through these just now, right? Mm, yeah. So just that we, we, I was looking at the- Just going through the diagram. To the diagram. Um, but just for information, here is a summary of exactly what Hon Chuan just talked about in terms of common areas. So I think it's good to also just recap of, of what, are the, what are the common information that are requested during audits and reviews. Yeah, so these are you know the, the documents that at least you need to be mindful of um, to at least have on hand in case of any audits or review. Right. Obviously, this one is your contract, your TV documentation, and then up to date organizational chart. Right. This is very important. Just make sure that your organizational chart is accurate. Right. So make sure that it's actually being reviewed and the personnel within the organizational chart exists uh, within the org chart. Then if you have your invoices, you have your JDs with roles and uh, responsibilities for your function analysis to so make sure that employees within your organization actually perform X with JD. And then whether you have um, your support on calculation of the prices, your um, TV policies, and then basis for pricing in the transaction. Generally speaking, I think all these will also be documented in the TV documentation. 
documentation as well. We just need to make sure that the work, working papers behind this are um, on hand. Yeah, I agree with that. Usually some of these will be there. So what you try to do is as a first defense mechanism, you have your documentation with your contracts and then maybe your invoices and then that being presented. And then if the TP documentation has been prepared properly, then probably organizational charts will be there. The JDs and responsibilities will be there. The calculation of the price will be there and the basis also. These last two points within the TP documentation and the contracts as well will be potentially covered. So you hope that between those three documents, you kind of can have a first line of defense. Mm -hmm. And then from there, uh, the tax authority may ask for more clarification, but you hope that with that, you can give them the framework and then keep them within that with their questions and during the audit. So key takeaways, Honcha, before we move to questions. All right, I think I think the main key takeaway, I think from this webinar will be your TP planning. I mean, as you see from what they've gone through so far, you, you realize that TP planning itself is more or less the key phase that you need to make sure you have in place. Obviously, it, more or less, a lot of taxpayers are not in that phase, but TP planning, if you have done it properly, right, you actually wouldn't need to worry about your audit. You can let them come in and say, uh, hey, I've done my TP planning, I've done all this uh, due diligence, I've got everything in place, I'll give it all to you. You can do your work and then I'll do up without any adjustments, right? So when you have TP planning in place, you would have less worry as opposed to, yeah, wait and see, then performing a TP documentation at the end of the time, then you expose yourself greatly. And the next one, TP analysis is critical. Yeah, of course. So basically, it goes hand in hand with your TP planning, right? So during your TP planning, your, all the analysis are, are done before at, or at entry. So once you've done that, then TP analysis itself would just be testing what you've done, right? And then lastly, of course, when you want to perform any adjustments, please make sure that it's um, performed before closing of the books. Because if you have actually wanting to adjust after closing out the books. There are, there are a lot of complications that you need to bear in mind. You know, not, not just TP, like you have your custom duties, your indirect taxes, right? So make sure that if you want to do adjustments at least maximum before closing out the books. Thanks, Hong Chan. So I think with that, we can move to questions. Um, there is one question that has popped in uh, here. Anyone else, if they have any questions, feel free to uh, type it in. So TP adjustments, there is a primary, uh, let me just put answer live, sorry. Uh, for TP adjustments, there is a primary adjustment which is applied by all countries. For secondary adjustment, does it apply in Malaysia and Singapore? Is pricing adjustment has been done? Is the TP adjustment still necessary? Um, there is no secondary adjustments in Singapore. Um, I think in Malaysia, we don't have Malaysia. Do, yeah. do you have it? We don't. So I think we have one session on this as well, right? Apparently, yeah. Indonesia has um, a secondary adjustments. Which yeah. is pretty interesting. India also has secondary adjustments. Um, mm -hmm. Singapore only has a year in adjustments, retrospective adjustments, corresponding adjustments. Uh, I think what Malaysia has is mainly kind of year in adjustments and corresponding That's adjustments. Um, other than that, we don't have secondary adjustments. The second question is, if a pricing adjustment has been done, is the TP adjustment still necessary? Hmm, I'm not sure what you mean by that because yeah. I will get that the if this is something that the company is doing within the closing of the books, a price adjustment is the TP adjustment. I guess mm -hmm. if the price adjustment is done because you want to reach the arm's length principle, then that is the TP adjustment, I yeah. guess. So it will be the same. Mm -hmm. Okay, it seems like we don't have any right. other questions. Yeah. So that's a wrap for this year. Um, please um, follow us on uh, YouTube, subscribe. Um, 
we we don't we don't uh, we, we do these ones for uh complementary but all we ask is to like us and follow us in uh social um, media we will also be um putting the schedule for 2023 if anyone has any ideas on what do you want to hear from us given that we have a couple of minutes feel free to put it in the chat and we can take it for consideration if there is any topic that you want us to be covering in 2023, feel free to put it in the chat. Or if you still want some time to think about, feel free to send us an email on services at transfer pricing solutions that MY. We will put it into consideration because we're just starting to prepare the exciting schedule for 2023. And with that, that's pretty much a wrap, Ponchuan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adriana. It's been good, yeah.